welcome everybody on this lovely sunny morning in Leicester anyway. Um, Helen is Helen Ashby. She came, she did a talk for us in December 2016 about the Sierra Leone Railway. And she's back with us online. She um, which is great. It's lovely to have you with us again, Helen. And a special welcome also to those of you who are watching on what we hope will be the recorded version on YouTube. And we are, we'll do our usual pattern. Helen will talk to us, share her photos, and then we break from okay. 10 to 11 until 10 past 11. Um, do use the chat box to make comments or ask questions. And enjoy, everybody. Over to you, Helen. Thank you. So, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, good morning. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about three different two foot six gauge railways that are all linked in a particular way, but I won't explain why they're all linked until the end. So, for the first half, I'm going to talk again about Sierra Leone and hopefully show some different photographs than the one I showed last time in case anybody saw that one. And then I'm going to talk about Taiwan and Wales. So, um, well, I hope you find it interesting. All three railways that I'll talk about run through some fantastic scenery. So, um, you know, yes, it's about railways, but it's also about the landscapes that they run through and the landscapes that were changed forever by the coming of the railways there. So I'm a chair of the Friends of the Sierra Leone National Railway Museum. And also I'm a trustee at the Welsh Pool and Lanvilite Railway in Mid Wales. Um, so I, I kind of come to this um, with a dual role. Um, so firstly, as I said, I'll talk about the Sierra Leone Government Railway, which was um, started in 1896. The, the, there had been for many years when the British colonised the UK, uh, the Sierra Leone, um, the, there had been lots of different proposals for railways starting from the 1870s and eventually authorization was given for a railway running from Freetown in the west right to the east of the country towards the Liberian border. The act that permitted that was passed in 1893 and then surveys were take, took place by a company called William Shelford and Sons um, and the original drawings of those are in the National Railway Museum in York. They turned up from the Crown Agents only two or three years ago. Um, the construction was carried out by British supervising engineers and local labourers. So this photograph dates from about 1898, 1899, and you can see a little steam engine built by um, Andrew Barclay, I think. And it's, no, it's a Bagnall, sorry. It's a Bagnall built locomotive, um, number three, and it's called Baibure, after a local tribal leader who resisted British rule um, and was the leader of what is known in Sierra Leone as the Hook Tax War, because he objected to having to pay um, effectively a tax on his house when he was the, lead, the ruler of his, his tribe and his area. Um, and it, cost, it, it, it delayed the construction of the railway quite a, quite a while. So it's interesting that eventually they named a locomotive after him, despite all the trouble it caused. You'll also see the, the ballast that's being laid for the railway infrastructure in those little hopper wagons, which were built in Leeds by Robert Hudson. And there is one of those, or the, the hopper part of one of those survives. It was found in a scrapyard in 2011 and, and acquired for the museum. Um, and they, they were used right throughout the operation of the railway, initially in the construction phase, and then subsequently for moving minerals around on the railway. But it's fantastic to have found such an early photograph. 
they were the photograph was donated by a guy who lives in Workington who's a photographer and whose father was a photographer and whose grandfather had worked as an engineer on the construction of the railway in the um, 1890s and early 1900s eventually he had to give up the job because he contracted blackwater fever which is a form of malaria and he came back home and died in Eastbourne in 1908 and that was one of the really um, oh, yeah. things about Sierra Leone was yeah. that it was so disease um, ridden that people dreaded being posted there and a lot of people colonial officers felt that it was like a a demotion in a way to be sent there because it meant that the government felt your life didn't matter anymore because there was a very high chance of of illness that's sorry i'm going too fast so the construction started as i said in 1896 the first seven miles of the line were, were opened and tested on the 29th of march 1897 and as far as a place called wellington and then the line opened to Waterloo on the 1st of April 1898 and Waterloo has now become basically a suburb of Freetown but was a rural community at the end of the Freetown Peninsula and you can see here the the engineers and the general manager having tea with the local um, chiefs to celebrate the opening of the station. The, the railway was completed um, as far as a place called Songo, which is about a third of the way across the country. And the official, the, the railway was then handed over officially for, from the contractors for operation. And this is the official opening scene at the terminal station in Freetown on the 1st of May, 1899. Construction continued then um, right across the country and you can see here the full 227 miles from Freetown to Pendambu which is just short of the Liberian border but in the area where the diamond fields are and if you look just west of Pendambu there's a place called Daru and that was a very important place because it's, it was and still is a military barrack, barracks for the Sierra Leone army and so the line was completed as far as Pendambu in on the 1st of August 1908 so you know construction was ongoing for quite a long time and then a northern branch from Bowyer Junction went up to McKenney in the north of northern province and that opened in 1916. Um, it, it was operated by originally by um, Hunslet locomotive, some Andrew Barclay. There was a standard class of locomotive which was built for the Crown agents by several different builders until the 1950s when these large garrets were introduced. And a, a lot of these photographs I've, I've used because they've not been seen publicly very much before. And they, they were taken in the 1950s by a man called Bob Wall, who was the um, chief civil engineer to the railway at the time. And they're a really good record, which is fantastic because, because Sierra Leone had a civil war from 1991 to 2002, uh, the majority of their records were destroyed. So we've gradually, as friends of the museum, been, been kind of, trying to gather information and collect photographs to, to rebuild that history. Um, at the Freetown end, the railway ran through the streets of the city and you can still see today the layout, the streets where the railway ran, which are now um, streets for pedestrians and motor vehicles. But here you can see the, the train just in the, in the background coming into the street but people are still walking on the railway line and selling their goods alongside um, and actually Freetown doesn't look much different today other than the rails have gone. And then out into the country um, this is um, a passenger train pulled by a diesel locomotive um, moving towards Waterloo 
across what's called the Orugu Viaduct. This viaduct was completed in around 19, uh, 1897 and it was known for being the most curved viaduct in, in the world at the time, built of, um, on trestles and concrete piers. Uh, it goes through lush forest now, as I said, Waterloo is almost a suburb of, of um, Freetown and there's very little greenery around it, it's all built up around. And sadly, although the railway closed in 1975, this viaduct um, was maintained intact, just the rails were taken off it and it survived right until 2012 when it was um, cut down by scrap metal thieves and all the metal was sold, stolen and sold for scrap. So a sad loss of a very important monument really. This is a photograph of Bowyer taken in the 1950s. Now, Bowyer was an, a very important place. It, it was the junction between that branch to the north and the branch to the, the main line to the east. And before the railway came, there, was, there were a few huts there, but there was no real community. So Bowyer, um, now as a township, is based entirely around the fact that the railway junction was built there. The, the whole of, of the town is within what's called the railway compound. So every building there was built for a railway purpose. There was housing for the staff. Um, there was a post office, the traveling post office has called here and collected mail, transferred mail from the, the northern branch to the main line and vice versa. Um, there was a school built there, a church, a library, or you know everything that you needed for a community and all of those buildings still are still intact and they're still government property but in in March this year that compound was declared as um, protected cultural property by the Ministry of Tourism and Cultural Affairs with the approval of the local chief. The local chief has ensured that the, the property was never damaged and never changed and was used for other uses, but maintained intact in, in the hope that some, someday it would be protected. And his dearest wish, he was in hospital, he'd been in hospital for nearly two years in Freetown and he actually discharged himself and came home in March so that he was there for the declaration of cultural property because he was so proud that his dearest wish had eventually happened. Um, what the Ministry will do with that is still under discussion but we hope that we'll be able to help them to um, create a kind of a heritage site with where local business people can continue to live in the, in the government properties and maintain them and they'll be able to set up businesses perhaps, um, catering facilities, residential, there is, there's no guest house there, but this building would make a brilliant guest house um, upstairs with an exhibition centre downstairs and actually encourage people to travel there. Ideally, we'd like to lay a piece of track along the platform edge so that people can get an idea of what, what the railway was actually like in its heyday. Um, this is a, a, a local a local train just to show the the volume of passengers and the way people people trade local traders come with their their goods to sell to passengers passing through again in the 1950s and this is this is um, a similar photograph taken at Bow which is this the second city the Birmingham of Sierra Leone if you like big trading centre and that there was a, a very important boarding school there. Bow School is the, the Sierra Leone equivalent of Eton and the um, train fares from wherever you lived were included in the school fees so the majority of people I've met who remember travelling on the train were schoolboys at Bow School and who remember going because they went to school by train. And the railway 
never really made any money. I think it made it made money one year and in the 1940s during the war. Um, but and after independence in 1961, I. I I think the the Sierra the new Sierra Leone government didn't really understand the importance of a railway not as um, a means of making money per se, but a means of supporting and and encouraging the local economies. It was the way you could get fresh goods from the centre, in the ag agricultural heart of the country, to the port. It was the way that you could get the palm kernels to Freetown for export. Um, and in, it, it, after the war, like the railway in our country, it was somewhat run down. And the then general manager, who was also a lawyer and a politician, Solomon Pratt, um, asked for a loan from the World Bank in order to refurbish the railway. The World Bank demanded a feasibility study and when the feasibility study came back it recommended the closure of the railway and the improvement of the road system and if you think about it this was this was 1967 this was exactly parallel with what was happening in this country with the beaching um, acts and so in Sierra Leone they achieved 50% of that objective and they began to, the phasing out of the railway. Unfortunately it was, wasn't until 2015 that any real improvements were made to the roads and they're still still ongoing but, but by no means adequate for the country's needs and the economy started to decline from then on. Um, this picture shows Richard Norman, who took over from Solomon Pratt as general manager of the railway, he trained with British Railways in the 1950s and then was headhunted to go back. And his job was to phase out the railway. He started Water Street Station in Freetown and the section between Freetown and Kleintown, where the main railway works was, was closed immediately. The McKinney branch to the north was closed and the, then, then after that, he started from Pendembu, gradually lifting the rails, using the railway to bring the metal work back to Freetown to go for scrap. And he, I, I did an oral history interview with him um, in 2012, and he explained that he didn't really agree with the closure of the railway, and he knew that, that the economy would be damaged by the vast number of staff who were being made redundant and he spun it out as long as he could. So although nominally the railway closed completely in 1975, trains were still operating between Kleintown and Waterloo right up until 1979. The engine you see him standing by is the Bayer Garrett locomotive number 73 and you can see on the headlight it was um, nicknamed Queen of Tonga because the Queen of Tonga had visited some years earlier and had been pulled by this train, this loco. Um, this engine is one of the ones that was preserved and is now in the Sierra Leone National Railway Museum. It's seen here on the 17th of November 1974 on the last passenger train ever to run on the railway. And the collection also has a, a railway ticket from that train. Um, between um, Richard Norman and his chief mechanical engineer, Ayo Cole, um, they agreed that it was criminal that this heritage should be lost completely everything had been sold to a Lebanese scrap merchant called Saeed, um, Jamil Saeed Mohammed, who was in cahoots with the president, Shaka Stevens, and who were, both of whom made a lot of money out of the sale of scrap metal. And Richard and Io, between them, identified things that they thought were of significance. 
and they hid them in what was the former carriage works at Klein Town on the outskirts of Freetown, the east end of Freetown. They hid them there in the hope that one day they would be acknowledged as part of the national collection. Um, they stayed there in the 1990s and people did go to visit, you know, railway enthusiasts traveling to Sierra Leone did manage to find a way into that building, which the, the, the people who looked after it um, called it their museum, even, even then, although it was never actually officially designated as a museum. Then civil war broke out um, in 1991 and for 10 years, the whole of the Klein Town Works area was um, a camp for refugees. The, the, the civil war, the rebels moved westwards from the diamond field area, from Liberia, and they moved westwards, um, sacking the countryside effectively, uh, arriving in, in Freetown towards the end of the war. And um, so gradually people were fleeing from the rebels and fleeing to Freetown, um, which, which caused a massive problem and massive over, overpopulation in Freetown. So this camp was set up and there were 10,000 people living in that, that area. Um, the building was, was um, filled with debris, parts were, were taken from the, the vehicles stored there, um, non-ferrous metal for scrap because you know if you could find a bit of scrap and sell it you could afford to buy some food some of the wood was stripped from the vehicles because that enabled you to light a fire to cook your food um, and and the whole thing was kind of lost in in history in 2004 after after the end of the civil war um, the, there was an organization called IMAT, the International Military Advisory and Training Team. And Col Colonel Steve Davis, who was a lifelong railway enthusiast, was posted to be Deputy Commander of IMAT. Um, the day before he went, a book was published by the Middleton Press called Sierra Leone Narrow Gauge, and he managed to get hold of a copy. So on his first weekend off, he was walking through the streets of Freetown following what he discovered to be the line of the railway so through re remember that picture of the train coming through the streets he came down there through um, across Nichols Bridge and down Fura Bay Road which takes you down to Klein Town where the works was and he was very excited at finding the works and he had a, he managed to blag his way in past the Chinese sentries um, because he had gone in uniform, because it's safer that way. And he was just looking through the building, through the windows of the carriage works building, and somebody came up behind him and said, Sir, have you come for the engines? And he, he nearly fell off the stool he was on and just said yes. Um, so the guy fetched a man called Mohammed Bangura, who was, had been the works manager post railway operations. And he was the key holder for the buildings there. And he took Steve inside and all of these ghostly vehicles were there shrouded in dust and cobwebs. And he couldn't believe what he was seeing. And the reason the guy had asked him if he'd come for the engines was because the Chinese who had taken over the lease for the site um, were waiting for the scrap man to come and remove the last of the, of the, build, of the collection from there. Um, because of his job, he had access to the president. And so he, he saw him the following day and told him what a loss was going to happen. And thus um, discussions took place and the National Railway Museum was born. And for the next nine months Steve laboured, he recruited some local people and for the next nine months he laboured and this was the result of his work. Um, apologies for the quality of the photographs but the light is very poor in the museum so um, you, you can appreciate how, how difficult it is to take good photographs. 
This is the Queen's coach, was, which was built for the Queen's visit for independence. Unfortunately, um, her itinerary was changed at the last minute, so she never travelled in it. Um, this is the pay coach. No, it's not, it's the diesel fitters coach. When the diesels arrived in the late 1950s, they proved so unreliable that a former passenger coach had to be converted with a generator and as a mobile workshop so that it could, could go with every diesel so they could fix it when it broke down. So we, this is Nelly, the oldest um, locomotive in the collection built in Leeds, um, by Manning Wardle in 1915. It was built for the, the, the line between the Water Street, the terminal station and the docks, but it wasn't really strong enough for the weight of vehicles it carried. So it was moved to Kleintown and used as the yard shunter right until the end. So from 1915 right through till 1979. Um, a Hunslet 262 tank engine, um, number 81 these were there were there were about 20 of these built it was the most common engine on the line um, this one was built in 1947 and the last two in the series were built in 1954 um, so the museum was opened in 2005 and it it attracted quite a lot of visitors but gradually as the, the economy began to decline and um, it, there wasn't much development took place. Um, Steve Davis left the army in 20, 2008 and went to be director at Manchester Museum of Science and Industry, largely on the back of the work that he'd done in Sierra Leone. And then when the director of the NRM retired in um, 2009 Steve was appointed as director and he was there for two years and at that time um, we started to to give more support we'd had we'd had a grant from the British Library and we'd had a grant from the British Council to support for the National Railway Museum in York to support the museum in Freetown under Tony Blair's Africa project and we were able to provide some development support and then in 2012, um, Steve left and gradual government cuts started to take place in the UK. So we decided that it would be sensible to form a, a, a friends group for the Sierra Leone National Railway Museum. So we could continue to provide support without it appearing that the National Railway Museum was um, spending its grant in aid on an overseas museum when it couldn't actually keep its own staff and was starting to make redundancies. So we pledged, we formed an agreement with the Ministry of um, Tourism and Cultural Affairs and pledged our support to um, help with acquisition and development of the collection and to provide training for their local staff because none was available in Sierra Leone. And, and to help them to develop programmes. In 2015, they actually recruited an education officer. So a lot of the work that we've been doing has been around um, developing interpretive and educational programmes. And here you can see um, myself and Mohammed Jabi, the senior tour guide, um, teaching a, a group of secondary school children in, in the museum. And um, school parties are absolutely phenomenal over there. It's the biggest audience and they, they, they come with a whole school. They're not, they're not like us where they'll bring a class and you get 20 or 30 people. They, um, they, they bring the whole school at once and, uh, and it's absolutely fantastic. So we managed to get hold of some Lego from the Lego Foundation. On the right, you can see the kids um, building with Lego and, um, and on the left, Mohammed's explaining to them how a steam engine works. Uh, in 2018, we raised enough funds to help them to build a playground 
um, and it was inaugurated that November. And so it brings, it's great because it not only provides an extra activity for school parties visiting, but it makes the museum much more attractive to the local community. And what we're trying to do is develop the place as a community hub, as well as, um, as, well as a museum. Um, it's the biggest space in the East End of Freetown, so it, it can be used for all kinds of other activities. Here you see the local Sawe women's group having a workshop on um, bond, uh, well, no, no, the reduction in child initiation and um, FGM. So a, a great community use for the space. Another project that we're working on is surveying what remains of the railway up country. Um, because although they took the rails away, the rest of the infrastructure wasn't worth anything. So it's just stayed intact. Um, apart from this bridge which collapsed into the river about oh, seven or eight years ago now. Um, apparently there was a bus on it, so I don't know whether um, that's still at the bottom of the river or not. Um, that's at Mabang, just before you get to Songo. Um, this is the, this is the, the um, hostel at Pendembu, right at the end of the line which was built in 1914 for loco crews because they'd get there they'd have to stay overnight before they, they brought the train back um, and you can see how derelict it is now and that's the engine shed at Pendembu that's the the very end of the line it's still intact this was this was November 2019 and then as you see the railway bridges are intact um, this is Shebuema which is about two thirds of the way along the line. And the road that you see on the right is, is the old track bed of the railway. Nearly every town has a road called Old Railway Line. A lot of people don't understand what Old Railway Line means because they don't remember the railway anymore. And you can see the countryside in, up there is very lush. This is a place called Hangar. This was the engine shed at Hangar which is now used as a school, which, and, and it's great that these, these old buildings are still able to survive because that are in use for other purposes because it ensures their survival. So this is the education officer in the orange vest with a, with a group of kids in that school. And the building on the right is the, is the old station, which is more or less completely gone. Nature takes over very quickly particularly in the rainy season. And that's the station sign in the middle of a field. Um, because that field is, is required by the farmer for use, we asked him what he felt about the station sign going and he said he was really relieved that we'd gone there because he didn't know what to do. He didn't like to take it down, but it was really in his way. So he agreed that it should be taken to the museum and it's now been restored and installed at the museum. So another bridge you can see, the new bridge built in 2015 alongside, but the old Suwa bridge is still there. And then we come to Bawia, which is where the place that was declared as cultural property in March. So Bawia is at mile 64. It took us four hours to get there by road. So um, you can see that tells you how poor the road system is, despite the, the will to improve it when the railway was closed. This is the terminal station in Freetown, which is now the national bus station. And the window, the window at the top on, on the end, closest to the, this corner with the, where the doors are open, that was the general manager's office when the railway was operational. And this is a lovely, this is a lovely building. This was the Foreman Plate Layers Hut at Hill Station on, on a branch that went up to the colonial residences. And it was taken over when the railway closed uh, as the local church. So it's still in use as a church building today. And that's the end of that section. So um, with just a couple of minutes to go. 
Thank you so much. That, I, I love I love hearing that because I have heard that before, haven't I? In two thousand and sixteen, but an extra it, um, with some extra bits, obviously. But mm. yeah, it's really it's such a moving story, isn't it? And just amazing. And it, it's really <laughs> today that in in the museum, the question you get asked most is. Um, how can you help us to get our railway back? In the NRM in York, the most asked question is, where's the toilet? Where's Mallard? Where's Flying Scotsman? <laughs> there it is. How can we get our railway back? Mm. And the government is starting to make noises now about wanting a railway. So the museum's a really useful tool for them to kind of, A, as a research tool to find out what was there, and also to kind of advocate for railway operations. So it'll be interesting over the next few years to see what happens. If the Chinese will build them a railway. Um, yes, I think that was the plan. Certainly when I was there in November 2019, there was a, some Chinese engineers came to have a look, to have a look at the maps that were in the museum to see where the railway went. Um, Could I say something? Yes. Yeah. I travelled on that train in 1963. Wow! Water Street to uh, to Rotifunk and then on to Bo. Uh -huh. um, and as I left Water Street Station and the train pulled out, somebody wrenched my watch off my arm. So I oh. remember about Water Street, but I stayed with the family in Rotifunk and then visited Bo School. And it was, of course, a slow journey, but mm -hmm. there it was. Yes. Two foot six was always, has always been a kind of a maximum of around 25 miles an hour. And, and usually lines were much shorter. But um, that's, that's the normal maximum speed for any light railway. Yes. Gauge, whatever gauge. Yeah. So for the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about mainly the Alishan Forest Railway and a little bit about the Taiwanese Sugar Railways which are also two foot six gauge railways. Now what I didn't mention in the first section was why two foot six gauge was chosen and generally for um, two foot six was chosen for light railways because it was it required a lot less earthwork. It didn't, it, it could go around tighter curves. And so you didn't need to blast through mountains as much as you would with a standard gauge or larger gauge railway. Um, also for export, it was easier to send by ship as a kit of parts. And of course the costs were a lot lower. So, um, it, it meant shipping to places like Sierra Leone, which is very mountainous and has a lot of rivers, um, was much easier than building a, a larger gauge railway. The same applies in, in Taiwan, which is also quite mountainous in parts of the country. So the Arishan Forest Railway is a 53 mile network, which is substantially smaller than that of Sierra Leone but much more um, normal for two foot six gauge railways. It ran from Jai um, County in Taiwan up into the mountains to the um, mountain resort of Alishan. And it was built originally by the Japanese colonial government in 1912 to enable the logging of cypress trees and Taiwania wood which are uh, the indigent trees in the forest there. Um, it, it, passenger carriages were added to the railway in 1918 and um, because of the, the, the desire to go and kind of take the air in the forest at that time. The locomotives used were Shea, stat type locomotives from the America. They were purchased second hand from the Kiso Forest Railway in Japan. And eventually there are about 20 of them. And so you can see a couple of um, stolen photographs here um, of Shea locomotives in operation. They're, they're unlike anything that operated in the UK. 
having these very strange connecting rods, um, vertical connecting rods on the side and the offset boiler. Um, and here you can see them in operation on logging trains with the mountain backdrop. The, um, the railway was interesting for um, a number of reasons. It, it, because it went a, a fairly short distance and very high, it used a range of um, techniques for, for going uphill. Um, many mountain railways use the rack and pinion system so that the, the engines didn't slip. But um, in Taiwan, they used two main techniques. There's, there's, there's a big spiral that goes all the way around the mountain at, at, the, at the highest level. And it, it goes round several times. So they call it the, the spiral. And the other system that they use is the switchback. So they, they go up one slope on a, on a lighter gradient and then reverse and switch back onto the next slope up. And, and they kind of do this zigzag backwards and forwards movement to, to get up the hill. Um, using the adhesion railway system rather than the rack and pinion. Um, eventually the chaise were replaced by diesels um, and in the 1980s they, they took 10 locomotives built by Hitachi uh, which replaced the old rail cars and the, the um, remaining steam engines. But examples of all of those have been preserved and uh, displayed in a, a, a railway museum park, an outdoor park, if you like, in, in Jiayi. The completion of the Alishan Highway in 1982 led to the loss of most rail passengers um, because it was faster and cheaper to go by bus. So the railway then became primarily an, a, a tourist attraction. Also, logging, logging was more or less finished by then. So um, it, the railway continued in use for a while. And then in 2018, on the 1st of July, the railway was taken over by the Cultural Heritage Office of the Forestry Bureau um, and the newly established Alisham Forest Railway was born uh, as a tourist attraction. And here you see one of those Shea, Shea locomotives displayed at Alishan um, with a, with a, a mock-up parcel of uh, logs behind it. Uh, this, is, this is one of the Shea's in the, in the museum park in Jai. You can see that I went, I went last July in the middle of the rainy season. So we, we went from glorious weather to um, heavy rain in minutes. Um, and um, there you can see one of the diesels. This is myself and Michael Riley, who's um, used to be the, they don't call it ambassador because Taiwan was never a colony. So he was the trade envoy to Taiwan before, prior to his retirement, which is effectively an ambassador, but, um, but not officially so. And here you can see one of the diesels um, alongside the Shea in the museum park at Jai. And um, while I was there, I was, I was invited to go there to speak about um, railway preservation, the, the importance of railways in cultural heritage at an international conference last July. And a part of the conference was to take us on a tour of the various railway sites and explain the history. So this is our train, our special train for all conference delegates being pulled by a diesel through the Taiwanese landscape. And there you can see this, the Dulishan spiral as the train goes round and round, um, following contours as closely as it can and moving up, up gradually round this spiral system. and the train runs through the Alishan forest with these huge trees and then opening up vistas, 
across the landscape of Taiwan as, as you go past gaps in the trees. Um, at one point we were able to get off the train um, at the bottom of the Dulishan spiral and to um, they did they did a what we would call a run past so the train back down and then came came back up past so we could get photographs of it and that's that's one of the rail cars that was replaced by those big diesels and there you can see a part of the spiral the the, the white posts are the um, are the edging to the spiral as it goes round the mountain in the distance. Um, the forest railway has a regular timetable. It, it does several things. It takes regular trips up to Alishan and to a place called Sacred Tree, which we'll see later, um, and to this little village called Shitsulu. You go through um, dragon fruit fields and plantations of, of other fruits. And as you come up into the area where logging took place in the higher parts of the mountains, there are several communities that have been completely abandoned and they're just ghost towns. But Shitsulu is, is rather different. It's the final stop on the tourist train and um, the, the forest railway has worked very hard with the community in Shitsulu. But what had happened when, when this section of railway was abandoned um, before the forest railway took over, people who lived there had, had started to build to extend their homes and they'd encroached on the track bed of the railway. So when the the railway was starting the tourist trains and, and wanting to develop further. They served notice on the local community that these extensions would have to be removed. And at the beginning, there was a lot of suspicion and, and a, a, the beginnings of an outcry, but the, the Forest Bureau worked very closely with them to devise ways of extending the houses differently so that it didn't encroach on the railway. And then they worked together to agree how they could support the local economy so that there was benefit for the community and benefit for the railway. So here you see, instead of a ghost town, a thriving little village um, with, with canopies and service. So this guy had been working in Shanghai for many years and had had to come home to look after his mother who was now very old. So he'd set up this little coffee pod, serving really good, fresh coffee, um, locally sourced. And uh, he, was, he was making a killing. Every train, you know, it was the rainy season, it's quite cold up in the mountains, in contrast to Jai, where it's, it's very warm. And when you arrive at Shitsulu, a, a cup of steaming hot tasty coffee is really welcome so you no know, that was one of the benefits that the railway brought other people were serving selling vegetables and foodstuffs there were people with craft stalls there's a lady who ran a kitchen so you could get a warm lunch the local school children came out to sing to us and to recite poetry that they'd written about the railway and they'd created this museum room with artifacts from the old forest railway um, for people to see. So things to do and see that kept you in Shitsulu. This is the viewing platform above the, muse the museum building. So you can see the very tops of the mountains. Lots to do there, which made sure that you stayed there and spent your money there once you'd arrived on the train. So very good. Um, tourist attraction and then the train stops at very other various other stations where you can get off and go into the forest and look at the sites this is the the giant hollow tree that um, that's one of the most popular walks along the line and close to the giant hollow tree there's this little shrine in the forest which is really pretty and uh, people go there and lay their offerings 
and then go on to see the four generation tree which is where a tree's been cut down for for logs and then another tree grows from the remains of the trunk and that's cut down for logs and then another tree grows on the st stump of that one and you end up with this stump with four generations and a, and a generation of new growth. Um, and then the train goes um, down to Sacred Tree. This is the, the a heritage passenger train stopped at a station called Sacred Tree. Now the sacred tree was was the biggest tree in the forest. It's it's collapsed and been preserved in its collapsed form, and another giant tree has been named the jack the, the biggest tree in the forest. But it's it, it's a lovely place because you, you have this lovely station um, built out of lo local logs, the heritage train stand in there, and this this sacred tree at, alongside the railway. And it, I could see why it was considered a sacred tree because there's a, a real, you're in the midst of the forest with these huge trees around you and this one lying on the ground and it gives you a real sense of place. And there's, there's, a, there's a definite atmosphere that makes you think, yes, I could see why they would want to worship here. Um, that's me being a railway enthusiast and being invited onto the footplate of the Shea um, at the end of our, our forest journey. And so that's, that's really all I wanted to say about the, the, the Alishan Forest Railway. I was there just for five days and um, just found it a wonderful experience. At the same time, I visited a, another two foot six ga gauge railway at the Thai Sugar Factory, or one of the Thai Sugar Factories, um, as you can see here. Um, and this is the little locomotive and the people. There was a, there was a, a, a group of people who'd come on a, a driver training um, course who were being taught how to operate a railway from another one of Thai Sugar's factories and, and that's who these people are. And that's their, I think, Japanese built locomotive alongside a, a Dima um, shunting locomotive, the little diesel, orange diesel that you see at the side, which will become more significant later on. Um, this, this particular factory is, is, has stopped producing sugar and it's been kept as a, as a kind of a, a museum railway, if you like. So this is the old sugar factory. And you can go in the old um, bagasse cars behind the engine and it takes you right through the site, right round the site and through the factory itself. And one of the things they've done to make it attractive to children is create this, when you go underneath the factory, they've got this little light show um, very, very oriental style, um, cheesy sound and light show. And that's, that's the end of the um, section on Taiwan. And um, I'm going to come on to the Welsh Pool and Lanvire Railway, which of which I'm a trustee. And then I'll explain at the end why, why they're all linked together. So the, the Welsh Pool and Lanvire Railway, again, two foot six gauge, links the communities of uh, Welsh Pool with Lanvire Kyrenian in mid Wales. Um, Lanvire is a, an agricultural community and the railway was built in 1903 um, by the Cambrian Railways to enable the agricultural communities around Lanver, Maivard and, and all that area to get their agricultural products, notably livestock, down to the cattle, cattle market at Welshpool and onto the main line for onward distribution. So the line connected um, the, the um, agricultural community with 
the mainline station at Welshpool so that it could then go off and travel elsewhere. Um, this is a lovely picture of the train um, running through the countryside um, with the sheep showing you exactly what the railway was and why it was there. So this is um, the, the wagon side inns um, on the railway in its, in its heyday. And a few historical photographs showing the, um, the, original the original locomotives for the line. There were two locomotives for this line built by um, Bayer Peacock in 1903. Um, one, is been, one was named Earl and the other one Countess after the Earl and Countess of Powys. Um, mm -hmm. Seen here when, when it was um, operated as a goods railway. Taken over by the Great Western Railway when Cambrian Railways um, finished and then subsequently by British Railways and closed in 1956. Um, seen here as, as the railway starts to become overgrown next to the cattle market in Welshpool. Um, and like the railway, like the Sierra Leone Railway, the Welshpool and Lanvar Railway was a street railway, it ran right through the centre of Welshpool um, until the 1960s when it was taken up. When the railway closed in, in 1956, it was acquired by a preservation society, the Welshpool and Lanvar Light Railway Preservation Society, and it reopened in 1963. Um, following a lot of hard work to refurbish the railway. The, the Earl and Countess had been stored at Oswestry Works where they were built, where they were, where they were shedded, sorry, um, and, um, and they were acquired by the Preservation Society as well and they're still operational today. Um, so here you see trains pulling the wagons through the countryside and then moving on into pre preservation. This is, this is at um, Lanvar station, the, the terminal station in, in the um, countryside. And just some nice shots of the trains in operation. And this is the Welsh pool end. Now, here we come to the start talking about the links between the three railways we've just seen. This is Welsh Pool and Lanvar Railway locomotive number 14, as you can see, seen at Sylvine Loop, halfway along the line. Now, number 14 is of great significance to me because it started life in 1954 as Sierra Leone Railway number 85, one of those Hunslet 262 tank engines that I mentioned. And when the railway closed, or was closing in 1975, um, the general manager of the Welsh Pool and Lambert Light Railway Preservation Society heard about the closure because he had an interest in two foot six gauge railways. And at the time, the railway, the, the WNL was trying to find more passenger carriages because although Earl and Countess had been preserved, none of the passenger coaches had survived the original Pickering built passenger coaches. So they were having to look um, for extant carriages elsewhere. And the WNL was the only two foot six gauge passenger railway in the UK. The only other two foot six gauge railways were um, industrial railways. The um, Sittingbourne and Kempsley light railway was an industrial railway and never carried passengers. And um, there was a passenger railway started, I think at Whitsnade Zoo, which was two foot six gauge, um, but that, that didn't have anything suitable. So carriages were acquired from Hungary, Austria, 
and then um, Pascoe Rowe and um, a couple of his colleagues from the railway went to Sierra Leone to see whether there were any carriages there they could acquire. And they managed to purchase um, four of the 1961 built carriages that were, were we are known as the independence coaches because they were built through the crown agents by Gloucester and um, Gloucester Carriage and Wagon Company in order to equip the railway for independence as um, the UK government withdrew. While they were there, Richard Norman, the general manager, showed them number 85, which was the last locomotive still in operation on the railway, um, based at Fisher Lane Depot in Freetown, and just been used for the kind of final closing operations. And so the W and L bought that locomotive as well with, with some lengths of rail and some sleepers and some signal equipment and various other bits and pieces. And so um, the locomotive was, was shipped back to the UK along with the carriages and it was operated almost immediately on the railway until it spoiler certificate expired. It was rebuilt and then it operated again until I think its ticket ran out in 2010. And it went to the National Railway Museum at Shildon for seven years and then did a grand tour in 2017 to come back to Lanvar and it stands at Lanvar station on display awaiting its next overhaul. So there you start to see connections between railways. Um, this is a, a picture of the, the landscape um, that the, the railway is just running through it in the distance. It's very difficult to pick out, but this is seen from Cafroneth Hall, which is now the home of William Hague. Um, here you see the independence coaches being pulled by Superb, a locomotive borrowed for the gala um, a few years ago from the City and and Kempsley Light Railway and Joan, a locomotive which was brought back from Antigua and the Zillatal which is, is currently on loan for two years from the Zillatal barn in Austria um, and which is nicely used coupled with some Zillatal coaches that the railway purchased uh, a few years ago. So you see there's a the, the WNL has a truly international collection because of that uniqueness in the UK. And this is just a site of the, the station at Lanvar showing the heritage end of the railway. Um, in 2019, the railway set up a little museum at Lanvar in the former Collinettes wool factory. And uh, this is a, the workbench from, the tool bench from Oswestry Works, which was the works where those two original locomotives were um, housed and built. And the, the, the museum has displays about its connections worldwide and, um, and has children's activities and acts as an, an educational centre. Now, this is number 85 arriving back at um, Welshpool, uh, Lambar, sorry in 1975 when it came straight from Sierra Leone and now we see it standing at Lambert station and you can clearly see the SLR 85 plate on the, on the side tank there. Um, so the thing that connects the three railways is this, this international dimension to the WNL's um, collection. They um, Alishan Forest Railway asked has asked to be twinned with the museum um, in 2017, and a ceremony took place both in Taiwan and at Lamva, with Michael being um, Michael Riley being uh, uh, central to all of that because of his understanding of the Taiwanese culture and his friendships in that country. 
this is this was taken last year while we were there in July for the conference showing an exhibition that they've set up at, at Alishan showing the link their their twinning arrangements with um, the rest of the world and this is the the WNL section uh, it's interesting that the the Alishan Forest Railway is is or the Taiwanese railways are particularly interested in international twinnings because they are the Republic of China and China still claims sovereignty over Taiwan and Taiwan disputes it. They would like that to have been trying to set Taiwan up as um, um, the Alishan Forest particularly as um, a World Heritage Site but that can't won't get approval because of the threat from the Chinese because it means that they can't have a a sound management plan because there's always this threat of the Chinese trying to take over and therefore they've tried to gain their international status through twinnings with like-minded countries. Um, one of the locomotives that is um, owned now by the um, Welsh Pool and Lanvar Railway is a Taiwanese Dima locomotive um, acquired from Thai Sugar many years ago. Um, this is an identical locomotive to the one we saw in that photograph of Thai Sugar a few moments ago. And these are um, the celebrations of the twinning arrangements, if you like. The, the wooden plaque at the top is a piece of um, Taiwania wood with uh, engraved with the um, commemoration of the twin in between the Alishan Forest Railway and the Welsh Pool and Lanvar Railway. Then in December 2018, the Welsh Pool and Lanvar locomotive Dougal went to Taiwan to celebrate a twinning between the WNL and Thai Sugar Railways. So here you see the WNL's Dougal alongside one of those Dima locomotives again. And then in March this year, as part of the 15th anniversary celebrations of the National Railway Museum, uh, the Welsh Pool and Lanvar Railway formed a formal twinning arrangement um, between the two sites. And this was the presentation plaque um, for, that, for that occasion. Uh, this is the plaque that was presented to the Sierra Leone National Railway Museum. And it's actually the original works plate from Hunslet locomotive number 84, the sister engine to 85, um, a locomotive which was scrapped, but the, the plate had been acquired by the WNL when it went and purchased number 85. So we decided it was um, appropriate to give it back as, as this um, presentation piece. So there you have the connection between the three railways, all twins, all two foot six gauge, and all with so much shared history. Um, one of the things that happened during coronavirus is that all of our um, organisations had to stop trading from March until effectively the middle of July. Um, a colleague of mine on the board of the Welsh Pool and Lanvar Railway um, was invited to write this um, album book of the WNL Railway um, by mainline and maritime publishers. And the, the, the publisher very kindly offered to take all of the risk, do all of the marketing, and he would donate five pounds per book sold to the railway as part of its fundraising campaigns. Um, having acquired my copy of that, I then wrote to the publisher and said, how did you feel about doing one for Sierra Leone? And he, and he came straight back and said, it's a great idea, but you have to understand it's a smaller market, much more niche. How about we write um, a, a slightly bigger volume um, with a slightly smaller print run and I'll give you four pounds per copy for every book sold. So if you're interested in learning more about either of those railways, 
they are now available for sale on the um, Mainline and Maritime website. And I think I've got about four minutes to go, but that's essentially all I've got to say. So thank you for listening. Thank uh, you, Helen. That was amazing. So much, so much really interesting, you know, humane stories. And I'm, it's been really, really enjoyable. It's fascinating. Um, really, really nice. So thank you for giving us such a great start to the day. Um, and the, this has been recorded. All our talks are recorded with the permission of the speaker. And you can see them again on our YouTube 